guys so welcome back to uh, uh, another episode of Fatal from a Friday and 12 days of murder about to wrap up in like two more days and so uh, this one is another Christmas kind of themed case sadly it actually take, it actually took place on Christmas Eve and so because this is like the 12 days of murder you know the parody of 12 days of Christmas I just thought fit it in here and let's just go and get started you had your fun but you're sorry now you dress me in white to just lay me down I would have stayed till death took me out But then you fucked up and gave me the gun So I'll give you one more shot you So of course we gotta start with our killer Mona Yvette Nelson was born sometime in 1966 I couldn't find an exact day um, Sometime in 1984 she would give birth to twins A boy and a girl uh, Later that same year on November 11th, 1984, she would commit, um, she would commit armed robbery. She would commit a robbery and was sentenced to 10 years probation. In 1991, her probation was revoked and she would get sent back to prison. However, it's not said, like, how long she went back to prison or what she did to exactly have her probation revoked. But her, the official charge on her record is aggravated robbery. And so, she, apparently, since then, she had been charged with drug charges and apparently making ter ter terroristic threats to a woman. So, yeah. So, then, after all that, she went on to become a boxer. She would win her first and only fight on June 21st, 1997. And then the losing fights were apparently 2003, 2004, 2006. It is also said that at one point, she actually fought Muhammad Ali's daughter. So, I thought that's an interesting fact. Uh, but while she was boxing, she was suspended for a month from the Association of Boxing Commission. It isn't exactly said like what she got suspended for, but I guess it must be something serious to be like for a month. Um, after leaving the boxing world, she would go on to become a welder and a maintenance worker. And so by 2010, because her kids were born in 1984, she would have five grandchildren. So then on Christmas Eve 2010, Mona would go over to her, her friend Sharon's house. Because Sharon apparently and her were like drinking buddies. So she would knock on the door to ask to like, to ask would she come in. And so this is where uh, Jonathan Foster comes in, comes into the story. And so Jonathan Paul Foster was born on November 9th, 1998 to Angela and Richard Holden Foster. And so Angela and Richard had basically had like an off and on relationship. And Richard had even kidnapped Jonathan at one point to get Angela to come back to him. Jonathan would be found safe luckily. And Richard was found sleeping in a field according to sources. And so obviously they, they did they didn't like get back together after that luckily and so when he was six years old he went to go live with his uncle glenn her um his aunt which is uncle glenn's wife and there are five children on a farm in some somewhere in missouri glenn would say that his sister angela wasn't fit to take care of him due to her narcotics and alcohol problems he lived there for four years so up until he was like 10. in november 2009 he was gonna live with his grandmother mary and then Around Easter 2010, Angela had apparently gotten married to a David Davis, so Jonathan now has a stepfather. On November 12, 2010, he will be ret he will be returned to Angela after her getting a job and improving. So I guess like getting off the drugs and alcohol and stuff. And he was living with his mom. And so Jonathan was living with his mother and his stepfather David at, at one point until like December 12th or 10th. The sources differ. And so basically this is where Angela would grab Jonathan and take them to Sharon's house. So this is where Sharon comes into play. So Sharon pretty much is like Jonathan's babysitter and um, Mona's friend. So I guess they pretty much have a mutual friend at this point. And so they're, um, all right, so around December 10th, 10th or 12th, remember sources differ, jo David, the stepfather, had apparently like hit Jonathan so hard to where he hit the floor. And so then Sharon basically grabbed Jonathan and was like, you're not gonna hit my child. And so then they proceeded to go live with Sharon. And David, had apparently at several points it said that Jonathan was in the way and that he pretty much was like a pest and so earlier that day because so Jonathan is home alone and so Angela the mom's at work and then Sharon I don't even know what she was out doing I couldn't find where that was at and so before she left for work she had told him not to um let strangers into the apartment while she was working as a cashier at one of the grocery stores and so then, however, Sharon had apparently told her that she was allowed to wait into the apartment, but no one ever told Jonathan. So understandably, Jonathan's not going to let her into the door. Because apparently, I guess they had never met before. So he wasn't going to let her in. And so then Jonathan had actually called 
his mom and those jobs to make sure he was okay, I guess. And then was told by the manager that, you know, she couldn't get to the phone because apparently it was Christmas Eve. We're busy. There's a line, as you can imagine. And so the, there was like this urgency in his voice. And so the mother, sorry, the manager like went to go get Angela because like it must be pretty important for him to have this urgency in his voice. And so then she had called back several times, but no one answered. So then she leaves work and returns home to Jonathan Gone. And apparently she lived like less than half a mile away from where, from where they lived at the time. So then she calls the police. So back to um, Mona. So the fact that Jonathan would let her in, apparently this like angered Mona. Because apparently Mona was drunk off some vodka during this time. And so she took the boy to her house where it's believed that she killed him and then used a torch to disfigure his body. And at one point before she did this, he was tied up with some twine, which would later be found at her apartment. And then Jonathan's body was put into a trash can and dumped using her truck in a drainage ditch. So then back to Jonathan's mom, he doesn't know all this has happened. And so Jonathan was reported missing. Mona has also said to have actually been looking for him despite knowing where he is and what happened to him. And so the first suspect was Richard, Jonathan's biological father, because he has kidnapped him before to see if, like, even though it's been all these years later, like, better safe than sorry, right? And so, Richard, the father, would basically be found in Corsiana, Texas, which I had never heard of that city before, despite being a native of Texas, and apparently it's about an hour south of Dallas. So then, this is in Houston, by the way. And so they find him, they question him, he says he hasn't seen Jonathan in years, so I assume since he pulled a little kidnapping stunt, the FBI is able to arrest him, and then the police start looking at his stepfather, David. Because he did say that uh, Jonathan was getting into the way of him and Angela's marriage. So that he would claim that he went to the house to check on Jonathan at 1.30 to see if he was excited for Christmas. And then Jonathan had asked him if he wanted to play a game because apparently he was on the computer. And he declined and then left around 1.50 to go get Christmas presents last minute. So then he said he wanted to go with Angela but Angela's probably going to get off work late because again it's Christmas Eve. And so he went to CVS to go get the coffee grinder and they were out. So then the police asked him, I said, you know, if we're if we check the cameras and we like are we gonna see you on the on the um are we gonna see you on the tapes? Because you know CVS got cameras like in the store and in the parking lot. So you know, and then he would then say that he didn't even go in. Basically said like last minute, like screw it, and the police were like, Well, how would you know they're out if you didn't go in? So yeah. And so he then claims that after that happened, he then went to the bar. He takes the polygraph test and deception is shown, but he was at the bar for hours and he made some phone calls. So it's believed that he was involved, but he was not there around the time Jonathan went missing. So then David's place would be checked with no traces of Jonathan. A neighbor would say that a gray pickup truck and a black male was at the apartment on Christmas Eve. And so luckily for David, the uh, bar that he was at for like hours on the day of Christmas Eve had cameras and that purpose was the only thing that saved him from ever being charged with Jonathan, Jonathan's death. And so Angela would say that she received a phone call, threatening phone call about Jonathan, which is believed to be from Mona. However, another source would say that Angela did get to the phone and heard a woman ask if Angela was his mom. And he replied back, yes, ma'am, my mama's name is Angela. And then the phone went dead. Believe whatever, whichever story you want to believe. And so then Amber Alert would not be issued for Jonathan until the 27th, even though he was said to went missing the 24th. And so then Mona would um, first be questioned, admitting that she knew of Jonathan, but denied that she had anything to do with his disappearance. And she agreed to be even part of the lineup. Now, I couldn't exactly find if the person even chose her out of the lineup, but she agreed to be part of the lineup. So then at 1.26 a.m., a second interview would start with a detective informed Mona of a neighbor placing her at the scene. She would end the interview after an hour with police taking her back to her place with the agreement to speak later that day. By 8.30 a.m. that morning, police had already had a warrant to like check her place and police asked Mona for a third interview to which she agreed. And sometime in this interview, she starts coughing up blood. So then, of course, she asked for like medical help and she was arrested and asked for a lawyer. So then after some um, talking in the car, because they were on the way to their jail apparently, they would take Mona to the hospital for her to tr receive some treatment. A fourth interview would be done, and Mona would actually say later on that her 5th and 14th Amendment rights were violated. And so on the next day, the 28th, his body is found. He was identified through dental records. He was burned so badly that a cause of death has never 
been determined, even to this day, like 12 years later, it's never been determined. Um, at Mona's house, they would find Jonathan's sweatshirt and pieces of charred carpet found in her trash can. They also found blood on his sweatshirt that matched to Mona. Mona was arrested and held on no bond. She declined a trial and, st and instead let the state district judge decide her fate. And so her attorney would later on go on to say that Jonathan's stepfather was actually the killer. Because he would try to like basically pin the blame on Davis. And so, however, surveillance would show Mona's truck pulling next to a drainage ditch and the driver getting out to dump a trash can on the on Christmas Eve. And so Mona would admit that it was her in the video, but she didn't know that Jonathan was inside and that David himself had actually requested her to do it. She did admit to have to talk. She did admit to talking to Jonathan at the front doorstep, but left alone, like by herself. And so then David had been cleared to like his cell phone records and the surveillance cameras at the bar, like I mentioned earlier. And so her attorney would even try to say that David had paid her $20 to dispose of Jonathan's body and that she was drunk of vodka. So I guess that's why she agreed to it. Um, the judge didn't believe it, luckily. And so Mona would get charged with life with no parole. She only The only reason she wasn't facing the death penalty was because prosecutors weren't going for it. Otherwise, she probably would most likely got it. And so her attorney went to appeal the charges on the grounds so there weren't enough evidence, even though there kind of was. But okay. Um... And so an effort would be made to basically have her court papers released. And according to the GoFundMe, it cost $238. And $240 ended up being raised. Now, I don't know what specific court records cost $238. Sometime within June of last year, sorry, June of 2021, $240 had gotten raised. And so I still have not seen those court records yet. And so yeah, everything that I found regarding this case, sources down below. But I still have not seen those records that cost two hundred dollars. So, yeah, was Mona guilty? Was Mona innocent? You know, y'all let me know, and I'll see y'all the next one. Bye.